Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sean Casey. I'm the director of the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs here at Georgetown University. I'd like to welcome you to the latest installment in the Berkeley Center's anti-racism series. I, I think we have a remarkable discussion uh, ahead of us. And before I introduce our, our guest, let me uh, make a couple of general announcements that those of you who are regular viewers have heard many, many times. Uh, first of all, we have a we will have a question and answer section probably the last quarter of our hour uh, of discussion, and you can start submitting your questions now. And I encourage you to start typing those and sending them in as they occur to you. You'll see the Q and A tab at the bottom of your screen. So, as questions pop into your head or mind, or if you've got them already, please uh, start submitting them now so we can more efficiently move through those later on. I should also remind you that we are recording today's session, and if you had signed up, we will be sending this out to you in an email, and it will also be posted on the Berkeley Center website. And finally, uh, as I said, we're doing an anti-racism series, and if you go to the opening uh, page of our, our webpage, you'll see a link, which is a, a collection of the various programming we've done so far, going back to Charlottesville, down through today, on anti-racism. Um, our guest today, I'm happy uh, to introduce, is uh, Carrie Pimblot, who is a lecturer in American history at the University of Manchester. And it's really her book that we're discussing today, Faith in Black Power, Religion, Race, and Resistance in Cairo, Illinois. So uh, Professor Pim Pimblot, welcome. Uh, it's great to have you today. Thank you so much for inviting me. So Carrie, I have a funny story to, to start at the top here. I, I learned of your book a couple of years ago from my daughter, who at that point was in graduate school and studying religious history in America. And your book was, part of your book was actually signed for her reading in the class. Now, having been born and grown up near Cairo, Illinois, uh, she'd been through Cairo with me dozens of times over her, her lifespan. And so the professor started talking about this wonderful book written about the history of, of black power in Cairo, Illinois. And, and she immediately interrupted the professor and said, no, 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 sir, it, it's actually Cairo, Illinois. And he probably thought she was out of her mind and said, no, no, I think it's Cairo, Illinois. <laughs> but uh, uh, so let's disabuse our, our, our audience quite quickly. We're going to say Cairo, or in some places they call it Cairo, Illinois. Uh, we're not mispronouncing how the locals pr pronounce the name of the town. It is actually Cairo, Illinois. Um, let me let me begin. First of all, you've written a marvelous book. It's a spectacular book, and I, I'm I'm prejudiced, but we'll we'll get into the details of of why I think this is an extraordinary work, both as a sort of standalone history book, but also an incredibly time well timed book. So my my first question to you is that when I pick up a book of this kind of local granular history, but it's located in, in larger national narratives. There, there was a point in your brain where a light went off or something happened and you said, yeah, there's a story here. And I'm just curious if you might give us the, the background of, of, of why you, you thought this was an interesting uh, topic to chase. Absolutely. So I think there's two big reasons that I picked Cairo uh, and a local study in particular. Um, the first is for any students of history out there, uh, you'll know it's um, within this field that I work in that's called Black Freedom Studies. There's been a real shift in the field um, away from kind of national accounts, so I think they're really important, um, of the civil rights and black power movement, and towards a real examination of local movements on the ground. And this is, this is not anything new, it's been going on since really the 1980s. Um, but that shift for black power studies is a really important one um, because the literature on black power, as Peniel Joseph uh, would say, you know, being shaped by a kind of liberal narrative in which the movement was seen as the evil twin of civil rights, so to speak. Um, and as a result of that, it really not being explored in, in some communities where they'd had really robust black power movements. And so at the time that I came into graduate school in the University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana in the early 2000s, um, there was a real flourishing in the literature around black freedom studies, studies of the civil rights and black power era uh, of people recovering local black power uh, studies and uh, doing research on the ground. And just to throw some names out there, if people are interested in my book, you know, there's others that really inform my work, which would be the work of people like Donna Murch, uh, Matthew Countryman's study of Philadelphia, 
Ikenyeli Emoja's excellent study uh, of Mississippi, Hassan Kwame Jeffrey's work on uh, Lowndes County, Alabama. So those types of works were all coming out when I started studying the Black Power Movement at graduate school. But the second reason, and I kind of dropped it in there, is I was living and working as a British student um, in African American history in the graduate program at the University of Illinois. And um, at the time while I was there, um, I was involved as uh, we'll probably talk about a bit more later in a lot of local organizing. Um, and in the movement kind of context there, which was pre-Black Lives Matter, it was in the kind of period before the Ferguson protests, um, there was a real kind of emphasis by some of the local organizers when I talked to them about my interest in, in social movements and religion, you need to look at this town. This town, Cairo, has a history that's not really been documented and it's got a story that's really unusual because it's a highly religious black power struggle. And so it was really the recommendation of some of the scholars who were there and some of the activists that pushed me to have a, a closer look at this case study. And so a good lesson for any student here is, is listen when people give you good advice on the ground and follow it because uh, sometimes it can lead to a really fruitful project. No, that, that's great. And, and I think, too, you, you the, the, I mean, to be honest, some of the heroes of your story are, are either dead or they're advanced in age. So you, you're working up in some ways against the clock there. But you also found an astonishing array of archival material. So can you say a little bit more about how, how that search went? Yeah, so I, the way that I started the research process, and again, this is good for students here of history, is I began by looking at the archival and, and then eventually the newspaper records, which were what allowed me to put together a kind of preliminary narrative before I went and met people. So I had something to say. Um, and uh, so that process is really tricky in Cairo because if anybody who's been there will see that the infrastructure of the town as a big part of my project focuses on has been annihilated um, as a result of, uh, you know, economic kind of collapse in the city, the out migration of capital, um, you know, the completely under uh, servicing of, of public facilities by the state. So it's a, it's a part of the state where there really hasn't been long standing investment to make possible the kind of record keeping um, that we'd want to see. And then the history of white supremacy in the town, which is the central focus of the book, um, has obviously made it so even if these histories could be preserved, it would be very, uh, you know, unlikely that they would have been kept in the longer view. So a lot of the challenge of the project was finding those spaces where people had kept records of this movement. And I think that's the reason no one had really written a study of this town's history in terms of the, the enormous Black Power movement they have there, the very sustained movement. And so um, it involved going to and really leaning on a lot of really excellent librarians and archivists who just helped me to track, as we all know, track down stuff that I needed to be able to bring the stories uh, of people who had been involved in the movement to life so that I could go and then have intelligent conversations with those activists, many of whom are still around and kicking and living in the town, uh, continuing in many cases to do really good work some of them still involved in kind of black lives matter era kind of struggles no i i think you know, i've been driving through cairo literally for 60 years i mean i i was passing through there when i was two and three years old and i was there uh, less than a year ago and, and even driving through the town you can tell uh that systematic racism has a long troubling history there and of course all across our country but you can see it in the physical structure of of the city uh, and its unique geography has also contributed to that it's, it's located at the confluence of the ohio and mississippi river and it along with st louis i'm, I'm reading walter johnson's book now in st louis you know where uh, freed enslaved folk found Cairo to be one of the first places they could get off a boat and enjoy some semblance of, of freedom. Now, it, it wasn't perfect by any stretch of the imagination, uh, but you can just tell it's haunted in a sense that there's a deep history there that has not been told well. Uh, but you, you've astonishingly begun to unpack that in, in ways I would have guessed that the, the archival material did not exist. And on every page going through your footnotes, I was blown away by, by what you're able to find. You, you make a lot of the notion that, that Cairo is a borderland experience in, the term of, in terms of history of race in the United States. I'm wondering if you might explain a bit about 
how, what you mean by that term and how did that shed analytical light on, on your research? Absolutely. Uh, it's so interesting. I just find just your prompt there about um, also the experience of formerly enslaved people um, and Cairo being this kind of borderland space between slavery and freedom. Um, and it was the site of the northernmost contraband camp um, in the context of the Civil War. So the population of Cairo transformed overnight from being maybe 48 black people I think I found in the text that were there pre-war who'd built a fledgling black community built a church there um, which would go on to be the AME church in the town and were, were there just the first few black families but during the civil war the population exploded um, of people fleeing slavery and um, living in, in really challenging conditions on this precipice of slavery and freedom. So I would say in the longer view, I kind of use this notion and it, and it is central to the scholarship um, of black urban history. I'm building on some of the really important work here of black urban historians like Henry Lewis Taylor Jr. who have articulated that this region across the kind of southernmost part of the northern states um, so the southernmost part of Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, that those parts of uh, those states have a kind of different quality to their structure of racial oppression from the standpoint of Black people's lived experience over time there. And, and that structure is one that um, is quite unique and presents some real opportunities for activists, but real challenges too. So some of the things that are different about that region, as, as other scholars have kind of pointed out, and I'm building on here is that it is a really fluid region in terms of how racial oppression is structured in terms of the law versus custom. So often black folks are living in a state like Illinois where there are laws prohibiting things like segregation, you know, racial discrimination in certain services. But where they live in the state, the custom is firmly established in a, a very rigid manner as though those laws did not exist. Now that's obviously people living in Chicago experiencing discrimination, but the structure of it in a place like Cairo is very different. So for example, if you are African-American living in Cairo during the early 20th century, you are attending segregated schools, not because of where you live in Cairo, but because you are black. It is a pure racial assignment policy. And it has existed in every area of town in terms of all the practices of the economic sector, the political sector, the social sector. Black folks could vote, but there was a system put in place that made it very difficult, even though they constituted a very large portion of the population to have any political influence. So the mechanisms of racial in this region, I'm arguing in the book, are, are different than in the South and different than in the North. They're kind of a, an intersecting location. And so as a result of that, when activists begin to mobilize around the kind of what we would view as the civil rights period in the 40s and 50s, in that period, Cairo activists um, and activists across the borderlands really view this as like a, a test case, a laboratory for trying to push civil rights legislation because they have a state that has laws that on the books they can test, but the practices at the local level are really opposed to that law. So it's some of the first places you see some of the big legal and kind of um, you know mass demonstrations, test cases by the NAACP at the national level for uh, battles around segregation particularly. Right, and, and so in, in many ways, you, you, when you get into the, the sort of nitty gritty of, of your narrative, you, you highlight kind of three phases. You have this traditional phase in the, the 40s and 50s where Thurgood Marshall is, is brought in to uh, litigate in Illinois courts, uh, arguing for the, the laws as they exist being observed. And, and you have a white congressman in Southern Illinois who is actually working in Springfield to aid and abet the NAACP uh, to, to uh, force the government to, to actually observe the laws. And that's, that's different than in the Jim Crow South. Mm -hmm. That's very true. Yeah. Although if we're talking about Cornel Davis, he's a biracial uh, man. So his advocacy is coming out of still the black community. That's right. I've forgotten that. I'm 
That's okay. I mean, it's an unusual thing about Cairo too, which is that the generally in other borderline communities, you do find that there is often pockets of interracial solidarity. And this is as a result of the structure of many of these communities um, and often the religious dynamics of the communities, um, according to some other scholars like Tracy K. Meyer, who's worked on Louisville. But in Cairo, that is absolutely absent. There really is very little solidarity uh, around kind of um, civil rights struggles, even the most liberal forms of struggles, um, it's totally absent in the community. So yeah, this is a, it's a really unique space in terms of the type of uh, possibilities for activists. And, and to say this too, I think the other quality here that is really unique to uh, this kind of borderland region is some of the religious dynamics of the community. So for example, um, in Cairo and many other border communities, the, the kind of religious dynamics of the black community are, are somewhat different than in places like Chicago or Detroit, um, where there is a process of kind of religious diversification that's taking place in the black community through the process of the great migration. So religion in those places is going to be really important to mobilizing, um, but religious traditions are very heterogeneous for black populations. Um, and in a place like Cairo, um, that is not the case. You know, in Cairo, the religious tradition there is very homogenous in comparison. The vast majority of black Cairo whites attend um, in small number of kind of all Protestant, uh, but mostly Baptist and Methodist denominations. There isn't the kind of rise of other religious groups uh, during the great migration period. And so as a result, religion is something that binds people together in the community and doesn't present a barrier to mobilize. And in fact, it's got to be engaged in order for movements to really be able to be uh, successful. And related to that, I think the second key point there is that in Cairo, because the economy in that city and in many borderline communities had kind of collapsed after the commercial economic phase um, in the earlier 20th century, and they were outpaced, with the exception of maybe Pittsburgh, outpaced by northern cities like Chicago and Detroit, who really industrialized, Cairo's black population is solidly working class. It's mostly non-unionized. Therefore, there aren't other institutions that black folks might be mobilizing through traditionally than the churches. The churches is the central civil institution in the black community, in the black public sphere, so to speak. So that kind of makes it a place where religious organizing is going to be a kind of dominant theme in their tradition in ways that it's not always going to be in other places. Right, and in, in, in Central, I, I think two, two communities in particular, there's the Ward's Chapel AME congregation, which you, you really show quite brilliantly that, that through all phases, from like the 40s and 50s, the 60s, uh, and, and even into the 70s, that congregation is a, a locus for a lot of energy, both some of it ambivalent, but also some of it quite, quite invested. So can you say a little bit more about that particular community? Oh, I'm so interested in this congregation and it's, you know, it's a church that has existed there for a very long time in Cairo. Um, like I said, it's the church that was coming out of the period of, of enslavement, you know, um, and the people that founded that church and kind of built it through the early 20th century, if we do see class divisions in the black community, they're manifest in that congregation, right, which is, um, there is a tendency towards the kind of talented 10th class in Cairo attending Ward Chapel AME when there was a talented 10th in Cairo in terms of class structure. And um, the civil rights leadership kind of come out of that church in the earlier phase. And it, it's a denomination um, that, as we know, has played a very active role um, in kind of struggles from the Reconstruction period on. So it's a really important congregation that becomes a, a space where the leading black woman activist of the civil rights period in Cairo, the woman who's gonna go on to lead the NAACP in the city, um, Hattie Kendrick, that is her home congregation. And she is a leader on the stewards council. She's the head of the missionary council. Um, she's involved in um, a Christian mission societies. Um, she's involved with so many aspects of the kind of um, civil society work that's coming out of that church that helps working 
working class black uh, Cairoites to be able to survive in Cairo. And um, she, as a result, becomes a pivotal leader in the movement. But she's endlessly frustrated by the political divisions in her congregation between those people who believe that religion should kind of be the focus of like prayer and a personal relationship with God versus those that believe it should be a more social justice kind of outward facing message for this world, which she firmly believes. You, you, you found a very dramatic photograph of, of Hattie on, on, a, on a, really on a sidewalk with a lot of luminaries around her, but she's, she's this central figure. And even without reading the, your director, the, the line below saying, you know, this is so-and-so on the left, so-and-so on the right, you realize that Hattie McKendrick is this striking woman in the middle of this. It really is, is, is quite, quite a dramatic photo. Yeah, that's a photo of when she's the test case for the, uh, she's the school teacher. Uh, so she's the test case for salary equalization. Um, the, one of the first suits they fight around salary equalization, the NAACP is in Cairo, and it's trying to get black teachers um, earning the same salaries as their white counterparts. So she takes a real risk and she decides that she will be the, the uh, complainant in the case. And, um, and faces death threats, uh, loses her job as a result um, of this case, and um, afterwards is never able to be hired as a teacher in Cairo Public Schools ever again. So early on, she loses her ability to provide for herself um, as a result of her activism. And, and that's just the beginning of her activist career. Yeah, that's in like 1948, 49, 1950. So this is, is really quite dramatically early. Now, also, the, the Roman Catholic Church plays an interesting role there. I wonder if you might say a little bit about it, its role uh, in, in the middle of the struggles. That's right. So the Catholic Church is interesting because the vast majority, as I've said, of the African-American population is Protestant. But the Catholic Church, through the Belleville Diocese, opens very early in the 20th century a, a mission for uh, black Cairo whites um, called St. Columbus Church. And um, this is a tacit acknowledgement that segregation is, is total in this diocese. Um, and that the, the Catholic Church for whites, St. Patrick's Church is not admitting blacks um, into being part of the fold, not serving that community. And so a separate missionary uh, mission is established. And uh, many Protestants over time begin to attend that church, chiefly because it also provides a space uh, for people to mobilize in civil rights and black power struggles. So by the time we get to the black power period, St. Columbus Church is the epicenter um, of the black power movement. And um, as many will be familiar during Vatican II, uh, white priests come down to Cairo from the central uh, diocese and are involved actively in uh, the black power struggles of the period, uh, moved by this new kind of gospel message uh, from Vatican II. And so it's a really interesting space that produces kind of ecumenical solidarity and cross, some of the only cross-racial, interracial organizing that you see in Cairo is coming out of that space. Yeah, I, I found that quite compelling. I mean, you, you do spend a little bit of time talking about these really tiny pockets of allyship from the white community towards the, the black community, but there really was nothing quite as, as dramatic as what you saw there in, in this particular parish. Now, you, I think one of the central theses of, of your book is that the, the old stereotype between sort of the Northern black power de-Christianizing movement versus the, the Southern uh, King-oriented integrationist liberal movement, they really were at odds with each other and, and always circled each other warily at best. And, and yet, you know, when you fast forward to your other central, one of your other central figures, Charles Cohen, who is a product of, of Ward's Chapel, um, he draws, you know, he spends time in St. Louis and he has Black Power influences and affiliates, but he also then reaches out to the Southern Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And this is where John Lewis makes a sort of cameo appearance in your narrative. Yeah, I, I can't speak enough about Charles Cohen, who passed away um, only recently um, in the past two or three years, um, is one of the most under-discussed figures within this literature, I think, but one of the most important kind of thinkers and on-the-ground organizers in this region. 
um, an incredible uh, person to write about, um, a really complex figure. So what I really like about his story is that he kind of, to track what you just described there, of this kind of way in which we set the, the two movements in opposition to each other, he demonstrates that that's not a binary for some people um, who were involved in the movement. Um, it's not to say that there, there wasn't differences between the, the kind of ideologies, the strategies in some cases and tactics that were employed by people who were parts of these two respective and overlapping movements. Um, but just that for some people, uh, they lived through periods where um, certain approaches were dominant and then they reevaluated uh, whether those strategies, whether those ideas worked and they pivoted and approached things differently. And I think we see that now, right? I think this is something that all activists who are working on the ground, we're always wrestling with. Why are we doing what we're doing? What are the best strategies we can employ, the most effective? And we have to respond to changing conditions. So yeah, J uh, Charles Cohen is a figure who really emerges within the movement as a child, which is what's also so remarkable about his story. He attends high school in Cairo. He goes to segregated um, schools. Um, he experiences segregation in this city in every aspect of his life. And um, his experiences of that um, cause him at one point to become involved um, in activities where the police uh, pick him up and he is charged by local um, court. And uh, in order to get him out of the possibility of going to reform school, a local minister, Blaine Ramsey, who works at the AME church, um, approaches his mother and him together and the judge and says he'll take him on to work at Ward Chapel um, if he'll let him off from going to reform school. So that's where Cohen really becomes involved in the church. His family had always attended church, but he had been frustrated uh, with the inactivity of the church around segregation. And Blaine Ramsey is, is a different figure, a person who uh, is really pushing Ward Chapel, and Hattie Kendrick's really excited about this, to be actively involved uh, in trying to change um, the conditions that people were living in in the community through direct action. He's watching what's going on in the nation at this time and we're talking now around 1960, 1961 when he's arriving in Cairo and bear in mind at that point this is the birth of the student movement writ large. When we think about SNCC, uh, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee uh, who John Lewis would eventually become the leader of, that movement is really burgeoning at this point. We've had the sit-ins in 60, uh, the Nashville movement, which is where John Lewis uh, really begins to get actively involved with Diane Nash and others. And people in Cairo are not so far away. They're looking at Nashville, they're seeing what's happening there, and they are really thinking that maybe, and this is Blaine Ramsey, we could benefit from some of these tactics in Cairo. We could really benefit from a revitalized movement here that uses mass direct action, nonviolent strategies. And so they ask uh, John Lewis and, and other organizers from Nashville to come to Cairo to help them to build what they will call Operation Open City in 1962, which is gonna become a citywide campaign to challenge Jim Crow in the city in every area of life. It's focused chiefly on public accommodations. And before John Lewis comes to Cairo, um, Blaine Ramsey asks Charles Cohen, 16 at this time, to organize other school kids in his area and to get them ready for John Lewis and the other organizers arrival. So they get together 70 school children. In Nashville, we're talking about college activists who are really leading that struggle with community members. But here in Cairo, it's gonna be people that are 11, 12, 13, 14 years old. And so by the time John Lewis gets there, they've got 70 people in a classroom that they're gonna teach these nonviolent direct action trainings to. And that is the group that's going to lead a concerted struggle in the summer of 1962 to try to end segregation in swimming pools, recreational areas, roller rinks and restaurants. And that's really the beginning of the mass campaign there on the ground for the first time since the, the early 50s, really. And it, it really is dramatic. So they, in, in that era, I mean, you, you've got a, a couple of striking photos of, of Lewis in, in 1962. And this is a year before his sort of great national emergence with the uh, Poor People's Campaign in, in Washington and in, in speaking at, at the Lincoln Memorial. Um, but they did have some success in the sense that a, a fair number of, of uh, Carroll small business owners said, 
we need to do this, or we at least need to make symbolic gestures. So restaurants, to a large degree, were actually integrated uh, in, in the years after that, which is, for that era, it was really quite extraordinary in that part of the world. Yeah, it's an interesting case. So in many other places around the region, the, the, because of the conditions I described earlier, where the state law is working against them, places just fold without really having to do a large number of, of direct action protests. The, the threat of legal suits by the NAACP intimidates enough uh, proprietors who are engaged in over white supremacy. But um, at the local level in Cairo, they do try to resist. Um, and there are, it, there are a series of struggles where the, the young people are attacked uh, by vigilantes and by proprietors. But you're correct here. I think this is a really important observation, which is that the tactic does work in the arena of public accommodations to some extent. We do see that restaurants begin to serve people. We do see that many of the recreational facilities open up. But in addition to that, what we also see in the year that follows when you look at the NAACP's records, for example, is that there is a massive escalation in organized white nationalist activity. And so there is the formation of white citizens groups that are beginning to threaten and intimidate the NAACP and other groups. Um, and we also see during this period uh, that there is intractability by some of the city leaders who begin to make decisions like filling the swimming pool with cement rather than allowing children to swim together. So there's a, a bit of a combination of the two, which I think you see some successes and some limitations. And I'd say the one big thing that definitely comes out of this period for Cohen specifically, by 19, the mid to late 1960s, is a sense that this tactic might work for public accommodations, but is it going to really work when it comes to economic power? What's it going to do when it comes to jobs, which is going to be the big focus of the next phase of the struggle? Yeah, I, I think, you know, for, for a lot of my, my white friends from who live and breathe in 2020, uh, systematic racism is an abstraction for them. But, but reading your narrative to see the white backlash to the, that incremental progress there in, in the early 60s, you really do see how institutionalized the racism is. It's the city government, it's the city uh, economic engines, it's even the sort of uh, voluntary mediating public or civil society institutions that begin to, to really focus the backlash and institutionalize it there. Oh, absolutely. And I think we have to be cognizant of this right now because there's so many commonalities between what I'm seeing, um, you know, in this period in Cairo and what we see today in terms of organized white nationalism. So, for example, in Cairo, um, I'd say the real, real power of white nationalists was that they were the small business owners, as with many fascistic movements, right? So their opposition was really that it was them that were being asked to change their practices. Uh, they had already demonstrated they were willing to give up money if necessary, um, profits, to be able to keep certain kind of practices of white supremacy in place when it came to things like, um, you know, treatment of black um, patrons. So there had already been a culture embedded there that was very, very strong around kind of a, a racial hierarchy that was a lived experience and a psychological wage, you know, for these white business owners. And it is those business owners that are going to take over the city council. Uh, they are going to work together to form paramilitary organizations that are going to really wage violent struggle against the black community in ways that I think we see forms of organized white nationalism that have their roots in this period today. John Birch Society, White Citizens Council, etc. No, you see, you, you tell the story quite graphically about the, the, the largely segregated public housing there and the various white armed nationalist groups are routinely shooting into these housing uh, developments there at nighttime yeah. uh, so that it is literally a war zone and it's the armed white nationalists that are shooting at uh, the, the African-American black residents of this, this federal housing project. That's right, and they're in cahoots to some extent with law enforcement. And again, this is another common theme today. Um, you know, it's something I, I am very concerned about, which is the relationship between organized white nationalists and police departments, you know? So in this context, you see that quite explicitly that the police are allowing for this activity to go unchecked. The state government is having to send in uh, National Guard troops regularly 
to intervene over the course of the late 1960s and early 1970s to, to try to prevent this activity, though sometimes they also seem like they're complicit in it too. So there's ways in which we see in this story kind of what happens when, uh, you know, white nationalism becomes a, a key fab kind of the fabric of the society and all institutions across the society becomes very difficult to organize against. And I say that to say, that's why this movement is so fascinating to me. Like, people are fighting against odds that are enormous in this community. This is not like a period where they had, you know, a president in office by the time we get to the Black Power period that they could appeal to, or even really a friendly state governor, you know? It's a, a time period where there's very narrow political opportunities, kind of like our own, right? Um, economically, they're not in a great time period by the time they get to the Black Power period. There's not a lot of money going around to be able to make things possible on the ground in terms of job creation. But they are so skillful at what they do on the ground. And I, I really felt like in learning more about this, that story had to be told because it offered lessons to people living in our own moment. No, I, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, and that, I think that is part of the compelling power of your book. And, and if nothing else, it, it disabuses. I, mean, I have a lot of white friends who, who are surprised, you know, to, that, well, they're, they're, they're racists in our police departments. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you see, we, this movie has occurred many times back in American history, and certainly this is a, an amazing uh, uh, illustration, I think, of the fact that the, the armed power and white nationalism had been deployed many times in American history. This didn't just happen in the last three years in, in, our, in our country's history. Um, now, you, you go on, and we're, uh, just remind folks, if you've got questions, we've got a couple that have been submitted, but please, please uh, keep sending those in. You, you then, you, you really, you don't stop the story at, at the point of the outbreak of violence in 67 and some of the marginal progress, but you, you really also talk about the, the relative decline of activism in Cairo. But you, along the way, you, you also highlight the fairly robust national funding the activists there got from national religious organizations. I'm wondering if you can sort of tell us the, the, the end of the story, if you will, that last decade or two. Absolutely. So by the time we get to 1969, um, that's when the Black Power movement ironically just really begins in Cairo. Like they have this longer struggle for civil rights and they have a series of kind of stop-start battles in the city. But the most sustained struggle is the period from 1969 to 1974. And um, in that period, uh, Cairo becomes the focal point at certain moments uh, of national protest. It becomes the focal point for the media who descend on the city, um, who get shocking sights of what they see is a black power struggle that's coming out of churches that doesn't just involve young people, but also involves elders and children. It's a movement that is multi-generational, cross-class. So one of the, the kind of big arguments that I make in the text is that Cairo is a really interesting site for this reason, that it's a space where activists who are really skillful, and I want to emphasize this, which is that movements are built by people, and, and Cohen and the people around him, Kendrick, um, Ewing, others, were really skillful organizers who understood the community that they were working in because they lived there for a really long time. And they knew to make that movement happen, to make it successful against the kind of odds we just described, Black churches and the culture of the Black church that bound people together in earlier phases of the movement needed to be mobilized. But of course, they face real challenges in this period because mobilizing the church to be in support of Black power struggles, struggles that are going to advocate, for example, for armed self-defense against the, the kind of constant barrage of bullets that are coming in from white nationalists, has to mobilize a different set of discourses. And increasingly, the movement's going to fight on two prongs. So on the first, they're going to argue that there needs to be an economic boycott of any businesses, these white owned businesses that do not hire African Americans and treat them with dignity and respect when they're patrons. So that's one side of the struggle is an economic boycott. And then the second part of the struggle is while we're waiting 
for, for whites to, to make a change, which we have limited hope about because we've just lived through this time period uh, where we've seen their overt resistance, we're also going to build parallel institutions, institutions that are going to cater to the needs of black people in this community um, in a way that is modeling something very different than what's existed before. Now to fund those kind of institutions, they draw upon the resources of churches and um, they appeal to a bunch of different funding sources that I hadn't seen scholars really examine before, which is that there's a whole architecture of church-based funding that emerges during this period as a result of the struggles of black clergy working within national denominations like the Episcopalian Church, the Methodist Church, the Presbyterian Church. Those struggles are really important and deserve more attention. Um, Angela Dillard's done some good work on this front. And so that infrastructure, they apply for grants and they apply for all different types of pockets of funding, and they get about $500,000 worth of funds that over a four year period they siphon into building these separate parallel institutions, businesses, uh, daycare centers, uh, farming cooperatives, lots of different stuff, and they build an alternative type of society. And they have a whole set of religious discourses that they're using to kind of articulate what the principles of that society should be. It's one of the things that really drew me to this case study. And what I think they're activating there is a form of black liberation theology on the ground. Whereas we think of black liberation theology often in the literature as something that's very academic and kind of confined to seminaries, um, or maybe the, the works of great intellectuals. Um, in Cairo, we see that actually people are, are working and reading those texts at the local level and inviting some of those leaders from the Black Liberation Theology movement to come and speak in Cairo. And so they are really engaging that and giving it life in the types of uh, struggles that they're building at the local level and the institutions that they're building. No, I, I think that that's an extraordinarily undertold or even untold story that, you know, black liberation theology is being born under James Cone and others in the late 60s. And you're right. It, they were being read at Harvard and Yale and Chicago Divinity School and at Vanderbilt Divinity School and having maybe an indirect. But here you see quite the opposite, that, that there are stakeholders on the ground there who are imbibing this liberation theology and black liberation theology as it's being written. And I don't think that's part of the common narrative, at least within religious studies. And, and maybe maybe it's there, but it's not. Um, and unfortunately, you know, James Cohn uh, passed recently, and it would be interesting to really put the question to him: to, to what extent was your your work studied and had an impact in places like Cairo? Uh, but that was really. And again, I, I commend you, you. Your literacy among the the early Black liberation theologians that day is really quite striking. Uh, and it was really a, a revelation in, in the last section of the book to see that the Cone and others were being studied by the, the, the local uh, African-American uh, churches there uh, on the ground. Um, well, let me, we're, we're going to move to the audience here in, in just a couple of minutes, but let me, let me put a, a couple of other questions to you because, you know, within religious studies today, there, there's really quite the, the raging conversation that's now a decade or two old about do scholars have a public role or do we just kind of throw our work to the winds and hope it sticks somewhere and it's it's on somebody else to to, to appropriate our work and uh, and i'm i'm on the wrong side of that divide i'm very much for, for the public engagement of uh, religion scholars and and th there is a passion to your work and, and even in your your larger vocation beyond your scholarship i'm wondering if you can say vocationally what is the connection between your historical research like in this book in your ongoing work as a, a larger public presence so i think for students out there who will probably resonate with this which is that when i came i'm a first generation college student as an undergraduate you know mm -hmm. so i'm the first person in my family to get a college degree and i think i came to education as like a vehicle for understanding my own position in society to critically reflect on the world we live in and, and to understand how I can change it, to make it more just and equitable, you know? So that was why I came to the work in history. It ended up being the discipline I was in because of my skill set, you know, and uh, particularly the types of questions I like to ask. I, I think for me, history is a way of, of thinking about how elders did things. I mean, I do a certain type of history, which is I get to focus on amazing people like Hattie Kendrick and Charles Cohen. And what I'm doing when I'm in that work is I'm asking them questions uh, in, my, in myself about how they approach the world they lived in, the ways they lived as people, the ethic they live by, 
um, the ways in which they try to change their conditions um, over time uh, to create more just world for the people around them, their communities. And what worked and what didn't work practically, you know. Um, so whenever I um, live somewhere and, and I've moved a lot. So, you know, I, I lived in Illinois when I wrote this book. There's no surprise that I focused on Illinois because for me, part of the integrity of doing the work in my particular position as a white scholar who was working in Illinois within a black studies program um, was to go and, and be a closer to activists who had done this work themselves to ask them those kind of questions and to make sure that the work was accountable to the people that had been part of the struggle. And, and in doing that, I was trying to inform, I think, to some of the questions I was asking about my own organizing as a person living in the community uh, in, in central and southern Illinois, you know, so it was, it was part of a, a wrestling of my own, as any work of history is, if we're being honest about why we do the work. Uh, we always are a part of the work. Um, so now, you know, I, I live in Manchester, and for sure, activism is, is an ongoing central part of my life, um, if we call it activism, meaning trying to make the community that I live in a place that is more just and equitable, um, centering the most vulnerable within our communities in my storytelling and in terms of the work that I'm doing around kind of political uh, change. And so here now I do work that is focused on that in my historical writing and also in terms of the activist writing that I do that's more directed towards policy change. So yeah, for me, history is just a great vehicle for just asking the questions I'm asking as a human being, you know, which is that that's my first port of call is what is my ethic? What is my good work in this world? What difference can I make and what can I learn from elders, people that have come before me about what works, what doesn't work um, and from their stories and amplifying their stories so they don't disappear and this is key for me. Um, I just feel like so many people that have done this work become forgotten, invisible, uh, or romanticized even to the point where they're not real and human. Um, and so some of doing this movement history is about connecting the contemporary struggles with the, the as close as we can get to the real people that did this work before us, um, so that we can have a better understanding of how to move forward together. Well, that, that's fabulous. Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Carrie. Now we're going to move. We've got, we've got a few questions here, so let me uh, get to them. Um, so here, just following up on exactly that, um, someone writes, I wonder if I could ask, knowing Carrie is a formidable activist herself, what key lessons can we learn from the movement in Caro for organizing today? I think the big lesson I took from this, because there's a lot of assumptions now around Black Lives Matter, you know, being a, a kind of a secular movement or a kind of like not your grandmother's civil rights movement, you know. Um, I think a lot of that is um, is based on false assumptions about the earlier period of the movement um, that I'm kind of debunk a little bit in the book. I think what matters is like, you know, where you're located and the work you're doing on the ground. And the one thing I took away from, uh, well, one of the things that I took away from studying this movement was that in some places, religion can be a central kind of vehicle um, in the hands of really skilled activists if church support is needed. In other places, it may not be, you know, Protestant denominations, maybe something else. Um, but it's, it's not about kind of um, drawing black and white lines between these um, kind of uh, the nature of a movement and its ability to mobilize religion. It's more about who you are as an activist working in a particular place um, where the conditions may make it useful. Um, so that is uh, definitely one lesson I took from this that I'm kind of working on at the moment, wrestling as I'm sure many people are with the question of what role religion plays in contemporary struggles around anti-black state violence. Um, so that would certainly be one. Yeah, and certainly uh, th there's a lot of white Christian activism uh, of a racist sort active and quite visible in America today. So it's not, it is a very ambiguous uh, multivalent force. Mm. Uh, yeah, that's an interesting point, actually. That makes me, I mean, it's one of the things I've critically reflected on, which is to what extent the kind of liberal mainline denominational support that I found in my book for the period that I was looking at has any semblance of the strength that it had in our own moment. And I think one of the things that you can see is even though there are pockets of support, you know, for certain, that kind of infrastructure, that vast architecture of kind of mainline financial support 
has not been present to the same degree. Um, and that's because of the decline of the mainline to some extent and some of the challenges they faced within their own ranks over the longer period that I'm tracking towards supporting those types of initiatives. It makes it very controversial, but that is work that has to be done. Right, yeah, and I, I think the, the funding on the, on the right-wing Christian side dwarfs that of, of mainline Protestants today, but even there, uh, you know, the demographic decay, decline of, of white evangelicalism is very dramatic in the United States today, so ultimately, even those funds are, are, are on, in retreat, I think, and so I think the whole notion of, of uh, sweat equity versus check writing is, is going to be a dynamic to continue to watch uh, in this space. All right, here we have uh, two questions. Uh, in your book, do you cite Samuel Clemens's or Mark Twain's book, United States of Lyncherdom? He questions why generally good people in the area of Carroll would participate in public hangings of black people. Uh -huh. Secondly, as a civil rights lawyer in Chicago, about 12 years ago, I was invited to attend an inquest in Cairo in which a young black man was found hanging in the local jail. Most all African-Americans residents strongly felt that it was uh, still another lynching. The jury disagreed. Uh, also about that time, still another young African-American man known as Red was found dead in the local hospital the morning he was to be released. There was strong susp suspicion that he was murdered, smothered by someone. I was strongly advised not to investigate his death. Do you know anything about these two? I don't know. I, whoever that is should message me on email afterwards. I would love to talk more um, about that and, and the work that's going on around that. Um, that is absolutely critical work. Um, and I think it illustrates why Black Lives Matter movements today, even building on the, the victories that people secured in earlier generations, is absolutely essential because the particular racial formation that we're living through right now, to, to, to cite a really key work folks should read, The New Nadia by Sundi Artikita Jajua, defines our own moment as, as uh, one that is not a post-civil rights moment, but one that is a new nadir, um, a, a kind of context in which uh, this violence has continued and deepened, particularly in the forms of state violence. I'm not tying anything to people that they don't know now, but I, I think that is absolutely critical work to be doing that. So I haven't read the text in question. Uh, please do email me and, uh, and send me the citation. I should definitely take a look at that. You know, a member of my extended family discovered the hard way that uh, Cairo is not unlike some of the dynamics we saw at Ferguson. Uh, to drive through Cairo, which is about a two mile drive, uh, the speed limit's between 25 and 30 miles an hour. And he went roaring through Cairo at like 38 miles an hour and got a speeding ticket uh, and had to pay an extraordinary fine for being like eight miles over the speed limit through the town. So. Uh, much of the city budget, I understand, of contemporary Cairo is based on police fines, moving violations, and, and most of those fines are paid by, by local citizens who happen to be black. So you, you've got this institutionalized form of, of, of racism there that actually, it, it's a tax. And if, you, if you're African American and you drive in Cairo, you have an extra tax burden there. Uh, and that's just one tiny symptom of kind of systematic uh, uh, racial uh, violence uh, in too many American cities today. A uh, couple more questions here. Uh, about five years ago, there was severe flooding in the area. The question was where to release the flood uh, water from the Mississippi to submerge local farmland or downtown center of Cairo. The pressure was to flood Cairo as the least valuable area. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was, so the, the eventually flooded some Missouri farmland and uh, there was a, a lot of discussion uh, on social media and in the wider media by some political figures, I believe, who were encouraging it not to be flooded into the high value farmland, talking about Black Lives Matter, um, and Cairo, which is now a predominantly black city. Um, and in the end, they flooded the farmland. But I, I think it suggests something of how that city is still imagined. Um, um, and and the, the kind of ways in which figures who are involved with the state, right, directly are, have such a devaluing of the lives of the people that have lived there. Um, and the obscuring of their history has also contributed to this, the sense that nothing's good come from there, that the town is a kind of ghost town. So it's a large part of the narrative in Illinois around kind of this part of Southern Illinois is that, uh, you know, it's kind of a fallen down ghost town that has nothing of value there. You go spend some time there, you meet the people there, you know, many of the former activists. It's a wonderful community, a community 
community that has people that are making really valiant efforts today to try to halt the ongoing violence of the state through the annihilation of their public housing projects, which just recently took place, uh, you know, to be able to mobilize to try to address issues like this, the flooding situation, and the ongoing long-standing issues of direct state violence through policing, as one of your respondents just suggested, and also through, um, you know, the uh, economic crisis that the city's been living under for decades at this point. Yeah, the irony of that is back in 1937, they blew the levee on the Missouri side of the Mississippi to flood white-owned sharecropping uh, land to preserve Cairo because there was a hospital there and because of the white uh, folk who lived on Millionaire's Row, as they used to call it there in Cairo. But then you fast forward 80 years later and suddenly the, the corn is worth more in some people's mind than the people who live, uh, who live in the city. So th this question is, is actually quite a quite old one there in the precarious Mississippi River Valley. Right, we have one more question here. Um, thank you so much for this conversation. In, in your view, what are specific things that faith actors and faith-based organizations can do to support the movement for Black Lives, the immigrant rights movement, other movements for social justice? Mm. So I can only speak for, for white folks here, you know, um, uh, in terms of giving people advice. I mean, looking at the book, you learn a lot of lessons from black activists who can speak for themselves in the text um, through the oral interviews that I did. But to speak for myself, I'm also a person of faith, you know, and um, I've been in congregations at the same time as I've been involved over the past 15 years in um, struggles at the local level against state violence, you know, um, in many different communities in the US and then here in the UK. Um, I'm not going to pretend that this is easy work in the US within predominantly white denominations, you know, it's, it's not. And I've experienced ostracization for the work that I do um, around this in terms of white communities. But that's part of, of what happens when you are actively confronting uh, white nationalism, white supremacy within those communities um, is social ostracization. Staying in there is not easy, but I think some folks need to. I think some folks need to stay in and foster these conversations and need to model this type of work within those spaces. Um, you know, I really um, have, had some positive experiences since coming back to the UK here, because this new period of Black Lives Matter protests has swept the UK as well. Um, I know in the, in the United States, this period has really exploded beyond uh, anything we saw in the Ferguson period even. Uh, in places, for example, like Anna uh, in Southern Illinois, they had Black Lives Matter protests there in a former sundown town. I mean, I don't even know how to explain that after how, uh, and, and, and of course we have to question uh, the historical moment it's happening in and the degree of support and where it's coming from. And I think better people who are sociologists will do that uh, than a historian can. But uh, I think some of the work uh, here for me is around kind of um, even small work of exchanging reading lists. I'm encouraging people to read Black Liberation Theology. I'm encouraging people to read some of the great work of current church scholars uh, coming out of the US and the UK that are asking critical questions about racism within the church. So the church is a space where we do that work inside of the congregations we're in too. They are sites of institutional racism. We should be fighting it in those spaces and confronting it in intelligent ways. Um, and I think as well, for those of us that are people of faith critically reflecting on on what our calling is in other external spaces too so um yeah i don't have massive lessons learned i've had some hard battles trying to achieve that in the u.s uh, I, I know that it's a really difficult site of struggle but but keep it up because as we see in the black power periods in moments when there can be support from predominantly white denominations, it can make a real difference in terms of financial um, and social solidarity. Uh, and I do think that with all of its problems and all of the unpacking that has to happen and ongoing dialogue, I think that is really vital solidarity. Carrie, just in your closing minutes here, do you mind saying a little bit more about your own particular faith affiliation? Yeah, so I'm the, I'm the child of ministers uh, and they are Pentecostal pastors. Um, and so is my partner as well. His parents are both Pentecostal ministers. So we were both raised in uh, evangelical settings. And now I'm kind of like, I've been wrestling between denominations. I've been attending a lot of different places. I'm looking for somewhere in Manchester as well that, that kind of is supportive of this work, creates space for this work and where I can be of use within a, a congregation for it. And of course we're all on lockdown. So we're all on video services at the moment uh, with praise and worship on our screen 
screens, you know? So it, it's a moment for reflection, I think, for many of us about, you know, uh, where we're gonna be able to do this work, where we should put ourselves for the reasons I just said. You know, should we be in spaces where maybe we've grown up there and we believe we can be a voice in those spaces? Is it safe for some of us in there who are dealing with other forms of intersectional kind of, uh, you know, harassment, you know, around sexuality uh, and other issues? But I think that's a question that, you know, a, a lot of us are wrestling with. Well, I, I think this is perhaps one of the great questions for your generation in the wider Christian world. There's a, a huge hunger and a sense of homelessness that some of our traditional places we've come from are not as nimble as we would like and are not as publicly engaged. And yet trying to find that place where one can can live out one's vocation and discipleship is, is so precious. We, we keep looking for it, but institutionally we don't, we don't often find places that are, that are hospitable. But Carrie, let me, let me say this has been fabulous. Thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, let me remind uh, all of our viewers, the book is Faith in Black Power, Religion, Race, and Resistance in Cairo, Illinois uh, by Carrie Pimblot. It's available on Amazon. It's published by University of Kentucky Press. It, this is, this is going to be in my course. I teach a course on organizing for, uh, for justice. Uh, and this will be on our reading list going forward. So Carrie, thank you again so much. Wish you all the best in your work.